This is Speaking with the Enemy on the Thai Cats Audio Network. Here is Louis Butko. Yes, the show Speaking with the Enemy. The Enemy this week, the Montreal Alouettes, and it's a pretty big game. So I bring in a pretty big guest. Joey Alfieri is a reporter for the Montreal Alouettes. And uh, Joey, I, I was listening to Danny Machocha this week. He, he's not downplaying it. He knows this is a big game. Yeah, for sure. I mean, enemy. I mean, between you and I, that's a little harsh. I just, you know, I, I thought we were pals and and all this stuff. It's, you know, it's just the, the show point. name, Joey. Don't take it. Don't take it personally, okay? I'm if, offended if, a little if, bit. If here, Nate, but... if Natea J has got to put up with it, you got to put up with it too. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I think uh, I think listen, they they haven't hid the fact that this is a huge game, right? This is uh, this is one of those where you know you don't eliminate Hamilton per se, but if you win, I mean, you put a significant gap. Uh, between yourself and the team behind you right like it would be four points it would be a game in hand it would be the season series and you know if Hamilton wins then they've got new life so I I think that's the way that they've kind of approached the week Um, and I I would anticipate it's going to be a real tight physical football game like it usually is between these two teams Uh, we saw what a bye week can do for a team uh, here in Hamilton last week against the Blue Bombers what are the Alouettes hoping a bye can do for them? And and how badly did they need a, a, a bye week last week? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's a, the, the schedule is kind of weird in the sense that um, they had a second bye week in four weeks or something like that. Like it was, yeah. you know, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty strange the way the schedule was laid out. So, you know, I think it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know that you need the bye week, um, but I mean, in, in football, you always kind of do, right? It's, it's one of those things where when you take it kind of when you can get it. Um, and, and look, I think the other thing that they haven't hidden is the fact that they're 0-2 coming out of bye week. So, you know, maybe they did things a little bit differently uh, this time around because it hasn't necessarily played out well the other two times. But yeah, I think the way the schedules mapped out was a little weird, but it's one of those things where it's such a physical and long season that you got to take it whenever you can get it. Yeah, the Ticats who started the month after the Labor Day game uh, with a bye week. After this, we'll have a bye week. So it, yeah. it is a really uh, condensed schedule, but this is the home stretch. Where have you seen the Alouettes showing improvement all season long? Where have you seen them getting stronger? And, and where have they been impacted by injuries the most? I guess that's a two-part question. So I guess we'll start yeah. with the first one. Where have they gotten stronger, have you seen? Yeah, I, I think defensively you've seen there there have been quite a bit of, you know, there's been some improvement. And, and I think that was to be expected just because they added Noel Thorpe, you know, as defensive coordinator. I mean, it wasn't even halfway through the year. It was early on in the season, right? It was at the first bye week that they made the switch. So that was week five or six or whatever it was. Um, and, and obviously when you don't have a training camp to learn a new system, it takes a little bit of time. But, you know, you see all the takeaways in the last game uh, against BC and the defense has turned in some some pretty strong performances. So I think defensively, you know, everybody's kind of starting to understand Noel Thorpe's system and they've brought in some new players. They made a couple of trades. They brought in Costigan and Lyon and Raheem Wilson was uh, was let go by Calgary. He's been really, really good uh, for the Owls too. So I think in, in that aspect of the game, that's where they've probably improved the most. And, you know, in terms of injuries, uh, there's been some key injuries on both sides of the ball at different times this year, but you got to go with the obvious and not having William stand back around since the first half of the first game of the season. It's tough. And it, it maybe took them a couple of weeks to figure out how to win without the MOP of the East division last year. Um, but to me, I, it's funny. I had a conversation with, uh, with Will last week. We went strolling in old Montreal and we're going to, we're going to post a video up here in the next few days, but you know, I tried to spin it as a positive to him. And he, it's funny. He hadn't really thought of it that way, but there's just more tread on the tires. I feel, you know, he's going to be back. Uh, soon and uh, and so when he does get in once he gets back into football shape it's like you got a couple games left in October and then the stretch run in the great cup and then you know I mean you're there the playoff start so um, so yeah I think that's the one that's obviously hurt the most uh, anywhere not having stand back um, but you know they've found a way to get it done in the last couple of weeks they've been really good running the football with Antwi and Fletcher so that's been a positive and with uh, no Dylan win in this game, I'm sure uh, they are seeing the running game as maybe a possibility that that may not have been there at the beginning of the week uh, before we knew his status. Let's go back to the defense for a second, because uh, uh, a couple of the guys, whether it was Dane, uh, whether it was David Beard yesterday, who we talked to, 
uh, were really complimentary about the the D line of, of, of the Alouettes. And and for Tie Cats fans who, who might not watch all the Alouettes games, uh, who should they be aware of? Who you know should they not be surprised to see on the stat sheet at the end of the night? Yeah, it's it's a real deep group right now. I mean, you look at they they re-signed Jamal Davis, who had a real solid training camp with the LA Chargers. Um, they signed him at the beginning or at the end of last week. And so it looks like he's going to be in for this game. So he was a terror. Like he last year, there's he, he only played in nine games and he managed to get an NFL tryout out of it. That's how good he was in those nine games last year. Um, so you have him off the edge. Nick Usher's coming off one of his best performances of the season. He's been around the CFL for a long time. So I think CFL fans know what to expect, you know, from Nick Usher, a very physical defensive end guy who can uh, get after the quarterback. Mike Moore, I mean, that trade is, is worked out real well for Montreal, you know, getting more from Edmonton during the offseason. And they've bounced them inside, outside. So they've, they've he's played um, both. Uh, and then, you know, there's, there's other guys there, like a guy that maybe, you know, if you didn't pay attention to the last game, you don't recognize the name because he's only two games into a CFL career. But Mustafa Johnson, Mustafa Johnson was incredible in the game against BC, had two sacks. One of them was a safety. I had another sack called back uh, because of a penalty. So would have had three sacks. And he's just he's been a disruptor uh, on the interior uh, of that line. And then I, I have to mention Armando Sewell because hmm. nobody does across <laughs> the league. And unless you follow the Alouettes really closely and you really pay, you really pay attention to what goes on on tape, I mean, this guy is getting double teamed, sometimes triple teamed on tape every snap. And so he opens the, I know Mustafa Johnson gets a lot of the credit and he deserves it for his performance in the last game, but you have Armando Sewell, who's in his mid thirties, who's still playing at a ridiculously high level. Uh, and then we mentioned Costigan before. So the group is deep. Uh, Mike Wakefield is, a, is another interior guy uh, that's uh, had a really good season. So, I mean, we're up to, I think that's seven names I just gave you yeah. on the defensive <laughs> line. So, I mean, the rotation, you can keep those guys fresh because I, I think that's the strength uh, of, or maybe not the strength, but that's where they're deepest anywhere uh, with the secondary being a close second. But that, that group up front has just been, they've been real good, especially the last few weeks. Yeah, and I think that's uh, you know when I when I see a, a strong push for Montreal D lineman on the East All Star ballot, I'll know uh, I'll know who's making that push or who's talking to the football reporters of Canada maybe a bit more than than I am. Uh, now, Joey, uh, you mentioned him on the Seawell. I mean, obviously one of these those guys who who wants to win, and this is a team that's that's full of guys who who want to win. And I think you know Trevor Harris obviously jumps to mind and and wants to prove people wrong. How have you seen him develop? as an Alouette this season specifically, because I mean, it's, it's his team right now, isn't it? You're talking about Mondo or Trevor? Uh, Trevor, Trevor, Trevor. Yeah. I think if you look at the the way Trevor is, um, and it's one of, I mean, you know, now, I mean, you know, and I'm learning now is that you get the perks of being around every day um, is that you really get to see the ins and outs. And listen, it was clear in training camp, Trevor knew that he came in and he was going to be the number two quarterback. But he stepped onto the field, was unbelievable, had a rock solid training camp, was so good, but never complained about getting the number two reps, never made a stink, you know, nothing, you know, nothing like that. Um, and then I think for the most part this year, he's been spot on. And now I think the trouble that the team has as a whole is putting together one of those efforts. And they've had a couple of them, uh, but they, they haven't put together those efforts where all three phases of the game are clicking at the same time. So there's weeks where the offense leads them to victory and there's weeks where it's the defense. And then there's sometimes where it's been special teams, but usually it's two of the three facets that click when they win. Um, so I think they're looking to put one of those performances together where, you know, Trevor and the offense are humming, the defense is creating havoc and the special teams does what the special teams does. I think special teams probably been the most consistent facet of the game, but Trevor, I think Trevor's had a really, really good season. Um, and, and I think that they, you know, they, the, the way that they're playing, it looks like they're starting to take off at the right time. Ticats have uh, traditionally all season long been a first half team. Uh, that was very true last week against the, uh, against the bombers at home. Going to Montreal, we know they, they've been talking about, they know how difficult that place can, can be to play in. How important will it be for the Alouettes to make sure the Ticats don't jump out to a 10-point lead early and, and really take the crowd out of it? Yeah, I think the Owls have been a first-half team too. So if that's what's always funny when these two teams play. It's just, especially this year, 
it's like, you know, Montreal has had their struggles at times in the third quarter, but I feel like they've, they've sort of ironed that out uh, over the last little while. Um, but they've been a first half team uh, primarily too. So, you know, you want to get off to a fast start and, and funny when these two teams played on August the 20th is gosh, got off to both teams were pretty slow in the first quarter. So I don't know what that means, but uh, you know, hopefully there are some fireworks and, uh, and yeah, but I think it is key. You know, you always want to, especially in such an important game, you want to show right off the hop that you're ready to play and that, you know, the week of preparation that you put in, you know, you want to be confident and know that the guys are going to show it on the field. Yeah. And just, uh, you know, back to that bye week, uh, a, a week's worth of, uh, of beatings on, on your body that the tie cats have from last week, uh, the Alouettes were able to recover. So who knows, uh, you know, they might be hitting a little bit harder uh, to start. Uh, usually like to end with this question, uh, looking at the game as a whole, uh, finish this sentence. The Alouettes will win this game if what? You can just remove the if. The Alouette? No, I'm just. I'm just <laughs> oh, I'm just am I, ta- I, I talking to Mike Hogan here or something? No, 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 no. no I a think, little less trash talky than uh, than Hoagie no, would I be. Think, but, uh, I think one of the keys to this game, and I think you mentioned it earlier, is the the matchup that I'm looking most forward to watching is you know Montreal's had a hard time running the ball on Hamilton. That dates back to last year. So Montreal's ran the ball really, really well the last few games. They have. And Walter Fletcher's got into a rhythm. And Jess Renanto is having a really nice season. Um, and, and so I'm just curious to see, you know, can Montreal keep rolling in that way? Or will Hamilton do what they do typically against Montreal? And I think Battle of the Trenches, as cliche as it might be, I think Battle of the Trenches is where this one's going to be, uh, where this one is going to end up being decided. And, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, Hamilton mm. comes away a little frustrated because you don't necessarily associate Walter Fletcher and Josh Renantwi with big productive days on the ground, but I'm telling you, they've been really good the last couple of weeks. Well, if there's one thing we can uh, agree on is that uh, this game will not be boring. Uh, these, these two teams, it never is boring when these two teams uh, face off, whether it's uh, amazing last second, third and 20 conversions or uh, game winning yeah. field goals. Uh, these two teams uh, certainly have built some hype lately and uh, with the playoffs on the line should be a lot of fun. Joey, uh, enjoy the game tomorrow. And uh, who knows it's our last time seeing each other in the regular season, but you know, everybody, everybody's so confident that a crossover will happen. Uh, yeah. uh, who knows these two teams might know. see each other one more time. Joey, thanks for doing this, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Uh, are we making a bet? Are we gonna bet or something? Ah, uh, what do you? I got, I got, I got, I got a buddy. Uh, actually, a uh, tra- BT, our, our, a fantastic media guy. I've told him to bring me back bagels. So maybe if uh, if they lose, uh, you can just point him in the right direction of a, a good bagel spot. And uh, yeah, and if the Ty Cats win, we'll figure it out. Come on, I mean, what, what are you talking about? You win either way. You get. I know. Yeah. Way. <laughs> okay. Well, you weren't supposed to know right away. You were supposed <laughs> to think about that later, Joey. Yeah, yeah. I'll set uh, well, up. we'll take this off air because I don't know if it's uh, it'll be a safer uh, safer podcast bet. We'll figure something out here, buddy. Okay. But thanks for doing it. Thanks, buddy. And my thanks to Joey Alfieri for joining me today on Speaking with the Enemy, which is brought to you by Red Tag. Redtag.ca, back to the beach sale is on now. Extend the summer heat and start planning for your fall and winter beach vacation now. Book today at redtag.ca. Uh, you can catch a brand new episode of Speaking with the Enemy as part of the Tiger Cats pregame show presented by Journey Rewards uh, with Andy Fantuz and Bubba O'Neill. Uh, as part of the broadcast tomorrow, which starts at 6.30. Thanks for joining us here today on Speaking with the Enemy. From all of us, I'm Louis Butko, hoping you have a great day.